Tonight you have the honor and we have the honor to hear you speaking as first here in this center Ambiorix. So Father Jacobus, I think uh, monks don't like too much words about themselves, but just to say that I think you are there on Mount Athos since 1985, after you studied theology at the Holy Cross Theological Institute at Boston, where you was born and raised. And uh, since 1985, you live under the obedience of first Father Emilianos, who was a holy man and who passed away not so long ago, the abbot of Simonos Petras, and then since he got ill and uh, the end of his life he stayed in the monastery of Ormilia, you are under the leadership of Abbot Elisei, Eliseos, who is a well-known spiritual father of Mount Athos of today, and we will have the honor to welcome himself in November uh, of this year, 2023. He will come and speak for our clergy during three days, but he promised also to take the floor for our faithful, not only of our metropolis, but from all the Orthodox parishes and for all those who need to listen to spiritual talks as this of you and of Abbot Eliseus. So welcome and please take the floor. I don't know if you prefer to speak here or sitting as you wish. I would like to ask our needs to please begin by reading the prayer. Par la mort vivifiante de ton Christ, nous a fait passer de la corruption à l'incorruptibilité, libère nos sens de passion meurtrière et donne-leur pour bon guide ton inspiration intérieure. Que l'œil s'abstienne de tout regard mauvais, que l'oreille soit inaccessible aux paroles oiseuses, que la langue se purifie des discours malséants. Rends pure nos lèvres qui te louent, Seigneur. Fais que nos mains s'abstiennent de toute œuvre mauvaise et n'accomplissent que celles qui te plaisent. Maintiens dans ta justice tous nos membres et notre esprit par ta grâce. Car à toi conviennent toute gloire, honneur et adoration, Père, Fils et Saint-Esprit, maintenant et toujours, et pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. more 
as much as our Lord will provide for us, for me to come and to be with you, to spend some time with you, and to also create a moment of osmosis. Me receiving from you and you receiving from me. A gift of cohabitation, of love between Christ and his church. Because all of us are members of his body and therefore we are members of grace, members of love, members of his compassion, members of his mercy. I asked His Eminence to read the prayer which comes from the Presanctified Liturgy. It is the first prayer of the faithful. And I asked him to read it in French because of the fact that I know that some here do not fully understand English very well, but being here in Belgium, you do know French. So I will express to you my reasons for this prayer. When you asked me, Your Eminence, to speak about a call to repentance, of course I wanted to formulate these thoughts all upon the call to repentance which I had received to enter into the monastery and to be a spiritual child of Eldumianos. And his teachings on repentance were so crucial for me and my life. So this is why I wanted to share these with you. But during the second week of Great Lent, as I received the blessing to be the priest for the week, in the first pre-sanctified liturgy, as I read this prayer, I saw all of you. And I wanted to share the foundations of this prayer based on the teachings of Elder Mianos. So let us begin. O oh God, great in praise through the life-giving death of your Christ, you have borne us from corruption to immortality. We are born from corruption into immortality through his death. This has already happened. This has already taken place. And it is up to us to continuously understand what it means to enter into this state of incorruption, of immortality. So our church, in its wisdom, is going to bring to us this call of repentance. How are we to do this? The priest continues and he says, liberate all of our senses from killing passions, setting over them as a benevolent sovereign our inner reason. How beautiful. Our Lord is going to liberate us from the passions. These words are words which the priest says, but which introduces us into this life of the liberating of other passions. And we are asking the Lord to be a sovereign over our own inner reason, to inspire our minds, the way we are supposed to be thinking, the way we are supposed to be talking, the way we are supposed to be interreacting with our fellow man, reasonably, not unreasonably. <clears throat> Let the eye be averted from every evil sight and the ear be deaf to idle talk. So now we see that the priest is telling us about things which can affect us externally, our eyes, our 
ears, what we are asking the Lord to protect, reminds you of St. John Chrysostom, where he says, what good is it for me to be fasting when I go and I eat the foods that are very bad for me, or I will use my mouth to eat my fellow man, to harm my fellow man, to the words which I share with him, possibly even my thoughts, I allow them to run and to create unfortunate thoughts of evil, cursing, because I do not like what I am seeing. So our church is placing these thoughts into our minds to divert our attention. But then the priest goes on and he begins to say something else. May the tongue be purged of unseemly speech. Purify these lips that praise you, O Lord. So I am asking now from the things which may come from within me to be on guard, not to be saying words, not to be expressing my thoughts, but to set a guard around my mouth as we say in the hymns at Vespers. Make our hands abstain from wicked deeds doing only such things as are pleasing to you, thus sealing with your grace all our members and our mind. For to you belongs all glory, honor and worship, to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. We close with a glorification Because we are speaking, of course, to God, the one God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We must understand our call to repentance, of course, begins with the life of Christ, with his crucifixion. We enter into that crucifixion, into his saving death, at our baptism. And by entering into union with Christ himself, we then enter also into union with the Holy Spirit. And this is why it is very important in the sacrament of holy baptism that we first unite ourselves to Christ. And then we receive the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So together, both persons, the Son and the Holy Spirit, will then take us to God the Father. And we will be worshiping within that Holy Trinity, within the life of the Trinity. We become members of that life. But how do we go about doing that? We follow, of course, what the Church is telling us. Elder Rianos speaks, however, about this journey to repentance. And he has two stages for it. The very first stage is coming to the knowledge that I am in exile. Being a member of the church, I understand that living in the world, I participate also without even wanting it sometimes, but sometimes desiring it, in the sin which totally surrounds me. Because we are living, unfortunately, in a fallen world. So therefore, we try to make this world into a good place, into a better place. But how many of us, with the turn of the century, were speaking about this being a century of peace, this being a century of love, 
And yet, unfortunately, we find ourselves tonight praying for that peace still. Many will ask, will man ever learn from his mistakes? Some do, some don't. The ones who do will be images, icons, examples for those who don't. But will they be examples to imitate? This is the question. Will they be examples to inspire? This is the problem it becomes very important for us not so much to be speakers of peace, but doers. Not to speak about repentance, but reveal our repentance. In feeling that we are living in exile, away from paradise, away from being close to God. Our church presents us prior to the great fast, images, the prodigal son, who also lived in exile, who left from his father's home, who willingly chose to take what was his and to go and to splurge that because it belonged to him. In having this experience of exile, when we come to understand it, what happens to us? What happened to the prodigal? He began to sense the pain of what it was to live in exile. He began to understand the problem of not being obedient to his father. The problem of going against his father, not just not being obedient to him, but doing just the opposite. So this pain, this inner pain, is in fact what, as Elder Leonos would say to us, it is the pain of longing for something better. It's not a pain that really hurts physically, because the particle son, of course, was living in great pleasure at one time. But when he started to eat the rusks from the pigs, their food, he began to have pain in his belly, of course. And this pain caused for him the thought, how much better was it when I was living in my father's house? So he makes it a point to return. But was it enough just to return? What would that return have been without having the love of his father? A love which was patient, a love which was kind, a love which gave honor, where probably honor was not due. And yet, this is the call to repentance, the fact that we know we are going to have a Father who forgives, whom we can turn to, and we know will reward us once again for our return back home. Adam and Eve, when they fell, what was it that caused them to fall? Was it not a longing for something greater? Was it not that exactly which the serpent deceived them with? Our Lord God does not want you to eat of the fruit because he is going to give you that grace which he also has. 
the knowledge of good and evil. You are lacking that right now, the serpent was telling them. You want this, don't you? He tempted them. And they did want it. It was a longing for something greater. A longing for something which they felt they didn't have. As Elder Yenos would say, they were in fact very rich before. But how often do rich people understand that they're in fact poor? That they don't have enough of what they would like to have. And so they begin to devour from everyone else, to take what, wasn't, what isn't theirs, to make their own and to covet things from other people. Because they are understanding within themselves this longing for something greater. But they're being deceived. Because they do not know how to share that which they have with everyone else. This week in Great Lent, we have before us the examples of Lazarus and the rich man. Those who will go to services throughout this week will be hearing the troparia, which will speak about this. And we all know what happened with Lazarus, how he was sitting outside the house, waiting for just the crumbs from the table of the rich man. And what does the rich man do? He doesn't care. He doesn't take care of his fellow man. And we know very well what happens to him, how he ends up going into hell and he looks up and he sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. So now, who is rich and who is poor? Let us not take care of the things of this world. Let us take care of the world. This is something which is very important for us to understand. Something which the elder would stress regarding this pain that we sense is that this pain is a pain of our nakedness. We stand before our Lord, we stand before our fellow man, and we feel shame for our nakedness. So therefore, what do we try to do? We try to cover ourselves. Just as Adam and Eve, they ran off and they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. And it is from this example of covering themselves with fig leaves that the church fathers refer to the fact that the fruit which they ate was not an apple but a fig. That which they desired, which was so sweet for them, became also the same item which they covered their flesh with. They covered their nakedness with because they were ashamed. They were clothed with glory, but now they clothe themselves with fig leaves. Is this enough though? They understand that this was not enough because when they heard the voice of God, what were they doing? They were in hiding. And when our Lord asks Adam, why are you in hiding? He says, because I know that I am naked. And who told you you were naked unless you ate from the fruit which you were forbidden? Once again, the voice of our Lord was indeed a call to repentance. 
but our forefathers chose not to repent. They chose to cover their nakedness and to express their guilt to the Lord. And this is one of the greatest sins. When people come to confession, they come not indeed to repent, but to express their guilt because they want their guilt to be removed from them. That is the first stage of confession, but that is not repentance. As Elder Mianos would say, repentance happens once. If you have truly repented, you will never go back to it again. You will never go back to the same sin. And this is the problem that unfortunately we wish our guilt to be removed and once it's removed, we leave from the confessional, we feel as light as a feather of course, a feeling though, which deceives us. Because once we get back out into the world, we fall right back into the same sin again. And we have once again the guilt to go and to confess the same sin over again. So how many times do we as spiritual fathers see spiritual children waiting for a long time to come back to confession because of their shame, because of their guilt? because they can't look up to their spiritual father, who is an icon of love for them, who is an icon of forgiveness for them. But they feel as though they're ashamed before their father because they let him down. But this is, once again, the greatest deception which the evil one places in our minds. The God of love, the God of forgiveness, is there for us at all times and is calling us to repentance, has his hands open on the cross to embrace all of us, and he tells us, I have done this, this saving passion for you. Come to me. Come into my embrace. That is what we should be thinking when we see the Lord up on the cross. So, Yel Elder Mianos, from this first stage of living in exile, of understanding our nakedness wishes to bring us to the second stage of repentance. We begin it by admitting to the guilt. As we know, when someone has a bad habit, alcoholism, sexism, any of the isms, what is so important for them to do in order to begin their change? They must admit to their ism. Without admitting to that, there isn't going to be any change. So Elder Mianos tells us, It's important for us to accept our nakedness, not to be guilty of it, but to understand that we are sinners and we must liberate ourselves from that. And the only way to liberate ourselves from that is to offer that sin to God. I will bring you to mind the saint who we commemorated yesterday, Saint Mary of Egypt. We know her life. We know that 
Before her repentance, she loved being naked. She loved being with men. She desired this. El Dominos, and I will quote this because it's long. He says that when we come to the point of understanding that we are sinners, one of two things will happen. Either I'll get up and get dressed, or I'll remain naked. In other words, I will either present myself to God in my nakedness and say, I have sinned, or I'll try to hide from God like Adam and Eve. And when God says, Adam, where are you? I will say, hiding because I am naked. And when I emerge from my hiding place, he'll see my fig leaves. Why is it, however, so hard for us to present ourselves naked before God? And Elumino says this, it's very simple, because I am ashamed of saying to him, I am nothing. I don't have any power to do anything. I don't have any power to make any change. All I can do is deal with my externalness, cover my external nakedness. But the issue is not covering our external nakedness, it's exposing our inner nakedness to him. So Yerenda says, do you know what it means to go from thinking that you're special and important as the rich person in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man? From being respected publicly, from thinking that you've done great things, from being talented, wonderful, good-looking, charming, and I don't know what else besides to recognizing that, on the contrary, you're naked and of no consequence whatsoever. It requires strength to accept that, a lot of strength. And yet, we can't even accept the slightest blemish that we might have. Any fault, failure, error, or sin that we may have committed. Without covering it up, with a lie. And then we need to cover that lie up with another lie. And then follows another lie. So we're always living in lies. Once again, I will remind you of St. Mary of Egypt. When she was getting on the boat to go to Jerusalem, because there were these young men who were going to be going to venerate the true cross of Christ. And as her life says, she didn't want to get on that boat to go and venerate the true cross of Christ, but just to spend time on the boat ride with those young men. And those young men defiled themselves on that boat, even though they were going to venerate the cross. Elder Mianos, on one of my very first vigils on the Holy Mountain, when I returned to the monastery and went and reported the things that I saw at the vigil, how during a break in the vigil, the fathers would leave from the church, they would go and they would have a refreshment, and they would sit and they would talk, and I saw that some of them would also gossip, some would say things, some would get angry, some would do this, some would do that, and I started saying, wait a minute, we are here to worship a saint. We are here to praise and honor this saint in songs and hymns. And what are we doing? Why are we doing this? 
And Elder Mianos, he said to me, I was still a, a, a novice at the time. He said, and my name was Vasilaki. So he said, Vasilaki Mu, you know, even the monks that are going to go there, and they may even fall into sin, the saint that they have gone to honor is going to say thank you to them for even coming and even falling into sin. This is how much the unconditional love of God is, where the saint also imitates that. We need to ask ourselves, am I ready to do that myself? To honor a person who comes to me and desires a life of sinfulness. And I honor him, why? Because he has the courage, the boldness to come to me and to reveal that to me also. The condition is this. What is my reaction going to be to them? Am I going to end up condemning them, judging them for what they're doing? For the most part, this is all that they know how to do. Or am I going to reveal to them my love? And how can I accept them without joining them in their sin? But letting them know that this is what I know of. I do not condemn you. I do not judge you. And in my first week, of Great Lent that I was celebrating, we read from the four Gospels. Every day during the third hour and the sixth hour, we will read a chapter from each of the Gospels. And on the very first day that I was to read, I had the seventh chapter of St. Matthew. And the very first sentence is Mi crimete ina mi crithite. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. At that very time, even though I was supposed to read the whole chapter, I wanted your eminence just to close that Bible. That message was enough for me. And it reminded me of the words of Elder Mianos in a book which I have recently translated on hope and repentance. If you wish to be saved, it's very easy. Do not judge. There's a difference between judging and a difference between having discernment. When I have discernment, yes, I do judge, but I do not condemn. I know between good and evil. I say this over and over again to my spiritual children so that it can be embedded within them just as Elder Mianos' words were embedded within me. In this journey of the soul, seeking for his repentance, the soul can sit back and say, I'll do something about my nakedness. The elder says, yes, I will go and I will declare my sin. I will confess my sin and my nakedness, and naked though I be, I will nevertheless present myself to God. 
I become like the prodigal son, for I'm going to go to my father. The prodigal son says to his father, I am not worthy to be called your son. Elder Mianos, however, says to us, because we are children of our Lord, he says, it is good for us to tell him, you clothe me, because what I've been doing by sowing the fig leaves and by clothing my nakedness is not good enough. You clothe me. And in order to do that, the elder says that takes great strength because it's a humbling factor. It's becoming, as our Lord said, like a little child. Can a baby clothe himself? No. So, we place ourselves in the hands of our Lord and we say, I am a child, an innocent child. I wish to forgive and I wish to be forgiven, but it's hard for me. Dear Lord, help me, clothe my nakedness. This is the most crucial point, as Elder says. Will I accept the painful reality of my nakedness or prefer my version of the lie, my version of the fig leaf? Many of us are confused about the appropriate role of the strength which I need, the willpower that I need to repent. A lot of us invest that power and a great deal of effort in just trying to clothe ourselves. However, what happens is many of us confess our laziness. The fact that we have tried so hard and we continue struggling and this creates for us our laziness. We say, I'm too tired to do anything. Unfortunately, so many people that come to confession will confess this laziness. They start the fast well, but they can't end the fast well. They try their repentance, but they cannot maintain their repentance. And they're asking all the time, how can I become better in my repentance? It becomes a very simple task indeed. It shouldn't be difficult. It's as easy as the child just crying out and the parent running to it and tending to it because the child is crying. Which parent does not express their love to their child? So the elder wants us to understand our Father who is in heaven is listening to us. He listens to our cries. It's important for us to reveal the strength in being patient, in waiting for when our Father is going to come and pick us up and clothe us and tend to our wounds, tend to our needs, because He will. So strength calls for tremendous honesty and authenticity, as the elder says. I need to be authentic in my cry. I should not have alligator cries. The tears which, which children cry, when you see them 
and all they want is just to be picked up, and then everything stops. Because you show them that attention. That's not what our cry should be. The beginning of true repentance is when we are going to sit back, allow ourselves to be like a dead man, floating on the water and letting the waves take us to our destination having full trust in the Lord. Without that trust in the Lord, there can be no salvation. When we reveal our own incapability of trusting in the Lord, in doubting whether or not He can forgive us, then unfortunately, our salvation is in danger. But when we do play dead, he is going to take over. He is going to show us that even if, in fact, I die physically, I will not die spiritually because I revealed my full trust in him. That is the end of repentance. That is the true repentance. And that is what our church calls us to do. In closing, it's important to also understand something else from Elder Mayonnaise. Our life is not a life which is a linear journey. I begin here and I end here. Our life is circular. Because we find ourselves, as we fall into sin, we have a new beginning each and every time. This is the sign of hope that we have. That even though I made a mistake at one time, I can come around and have a full circle and begin afresh once again. So that is the hope which we have in repentance. That even though I make a mistake, I have that possibility once again of doing things right this time. Our Lord gives us our breath and this is the miracle of life. So let us accept each and every moment of beginning a new life of confessing our sins in the hopes of bringing it to of true repentance, a full repentance. This we ask through the prayers of our Holy Master and all of the Holy Fathers that are present. Amen. I thank you in the name of all those who are present tonight here for your spiritual leading. You speak with your heart, you speak with the experience you have as a monk of Mount Athos, living in obedience. First of all, for years under the leadership of uh, the respectful and the late Father Emilianos, and today under the leadership of your abbot, Father Eliseos. And uh, we are so thankful that uh, you took time to bring us into this. Uh, reflection 
on a very important issue as we stand uh, today almost before the great and holy week, before the passion of Christ and before his resurrection. How can we live resurrection without repentance? And that's why we ask you to, to give us today this lecture with this subject. Uh, now, as we are used to it, we can give some time to the floor and um, I mean to the, the people here and uh, to let them ask you some questions if you agree. Hmm. There is a microphone, so if someone wants to put a question, he just uh, lift up his hand. Is there someone who wants to make a comment? Someone that wants to ask a question. There is a lady there in the back side, a young lady. Just uh, put it very clear and short, please. spiritual father and you feel as though you have done something which is wrong, you bring this to him. One of the most important aspects of having a spiritual father is to be attentive so that when you ask you shall receive a response whether or not what you have done is right or wrong. And even if you feel that what your spiritual father is telling you doesn't sound right. Saint Affirm of Katunaki would say to us, it may not sound right to you, but in fact it is right and you need to be obedient because obedience is going to correct it. Sometimes we have an issue where my own experience in life has taught me how to do something. But like the examples which we said about the sowing of leaves, the covering of our nakedness, we are trying as best as we can to, to, to cover our nakedness, to cover our shame. But we are not successful in it because we don't know how to do it right. So that's why our Lord provides us with spiritual fathers, so they can guide us and teach us into what is right. I need to give the opportunity to the obedience to my spiritual father to work positively in my life. Thank you. But, uh, and I end up saying this, um, if sin is based in shame, and yet you might very well be ignorant because sometimes ignorance is bliss. Where will the truth be? The truth, of course, is always in Christ. And when you choose to be obedient, you are imitating Christ in his obedience to his Father, even unto death. So this is the thing which is, becomes very important. Your action is going to reveal to the Lord what it is that you truly desire. 
And he will not leave you in that ignorance. He will enlighten your mind and he will enlighten the path before you so that you can travel it safely. But this is something which you do definitely need to desire within yourself deeply, okay? Sometimes when we desire it superficially, we are, what we're doing is we want to hear the things we want to hear, okay? And that's why ultimately when our spiritual father tells us something that we disagree with, it's because we aren't hearing what we want to hear. So it's something superficial. I agree with, it's just, it doesn't feel enough. <laughs> this is where you, your experience is also going to teach you. Elder Mianos would say this, sometimes many people they say, how am I going to learn to pray? Teach me how to pray. And what he would say is this, you want to learn how to pray, just begin praying. But prayer itself is going to teach you. Okay, so, so this is the thing, it is, it, it is very simple, it's very simple to lead a life of repentance. All we need to do is just begin doing it. Not talking about it, not thinking about it, do it, act on it. There was a question over here in your hands which you didn't see because he's behind. Oh, well, uh, he's behind is the, the mic wall. here behind the wall? Yes, 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 we have it right here. Hello, thank you for coming back. Uh, I, I listened to your conference last year. Yes, I remember you. Yeah, thank you very much. You had a very good question also last Excuse year. me? You had a very good question last <laughs> year. I hope that now I have to now. Uh, unfortunately, I was late. I hope it doesn't uh, cover a subject which was already answered in okay. your conference. In fact, I have a question also, um, a simple one and uh, more. It's not mine, so I, I just put it. For example, the prodigal son, at the very moment, so you explain this circle, which we have the opportunity to start over from that moment. Uh, but uh, this is nice in theory, but in practice, at the very moment when we are down, when, uh, in that moment that we are in the peaks, uh, we, we have a risk to, be, to become like Judah. We can go in a, a depression, if we go over that moment, we can get in that spark, uh, spirit and take it over. But at the very moment when we uh, make a mistake, we can go in that, uh, we can go down. And what the mechanism, how we can be sure that we don't go in that down direction, but we go, we start going in that spirit. So we, we, we repent, we, we feel sorrow, and we, we try to change the things. Because in theory it's nice, but in practice, it's not so easy. Excuse me, I'll disagree with you. <laughs> and I will disagree with you, why? This is exactly why the church provides us with these examples. Real examples. Not just theoretical examples. So we have the difference between Judas and Peter. Both wept. For what they did. The one, however, felt guilt and shame. The other wept out of repentance. So this is the difference. When you have that shame, which is unfortunately out of our own ego, this is what's going to lead us to the path of Judas. And we will go and commit suicide because we don't place our hope in the Lord. He is not the Lord of love, the Lord of forgiveness. Peter, however, he wept, and he ran away and he hid, along with all the other disciples. We know very well that John was the only one that remained. That took courage. That was authentic. The other disciples, they learned, however, from their own fear. Their fear created doubts. But it did not lead them into that state that Judas himself 
was led because of what Judas did. So it becomes a very important aspect for us to also understand something very, very crucial here. Will Judas be forgiven? Some fathers speak about not only Judas being forgiven, but there being, once again, salvation for everyone, including the evil one. This is a teaching, however, which the church does not fully accept. And we say that it is a thorough woman. Our issue is this, whether or not our Lord is going to forgive, it is up to him. What we need to understand is not if the other person is going to be forgiven, am I going to be forgiven? And is what I am doing in my life enough for the Lord to look at me and to say, my child, I forgive you. Because when we say in the, priest, the, the, the prayer of absolution that I as a priest have no power to forgive sins on earth, it means what? It means that what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to remove the guilt because our Lord said to me, the sins that you shall forgive shall be forgiven and the sins that you shall retain shall be retained. Elder Mianos would say this though. The guilt is removed. The sin is forgiven. But do we maintain a life after that which reveals that the sin has been forgiven? If I truly was forgiven, if I truly believe in the prayer which the priest read over me, then I rejoice. And I live my life the way I should before the Lord. So that's why Judas, after he went and tried to cover his guilt by throwing the, the 30 pieces of, gold, of silver back, if he truly repented, he would not have been led to kill himself. So that's why, in theory, the praxis is present. In order for us to have praxis, we must have the theory. It's very important. We cannot have praxis without theory. Okay? That's why Yenaminos, when he would speak to us, many of the fathers would say, you're speaking so theoretical. Speak practical. And he'd laugh. He'd laugh at us. He says, but the theory is praxis. The theory is praxis. So that's why it's up to us to begin implementing it. That's the issue. We unfortunately sometimes fall weak in doing that. And that's where we need to have examples to inspire us. How is it when we see the Olympic Games? That sometimes we look and it looks so easy that we can sit there and we can say, I want to go do that myself. And then we understand how difficult it really is. But if we truly, truly want to do it, then we are going to do what? We are going to persist in it. So that's why the concept which is important for us is knowing how to persist in the theories so that we can have the praxis. You had a second question, though. Yes, thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, the second question maybe is somehow related to this one. Uh, yesterday I heard something very... I was uh, contradictory. Uh, I was thinking that uh, we, we know all that the fear of God is very important. And I was thinking that this would... I would get close to it or understand some of it just by respecting the, 
the rules or the the life of the church. But yesterday I heard one word which I didn't know how to pick it up. Um, so the person said that um, the fear of God, you don't get to it by uh, by um, cultivating it. But in fact, it's just like an inheritance. And you have to find a person who has the fear of God in order to get it as an inheritance. Like, um, Ellie, probably, with this response. But, and the first question is, is it, I guess it's like that, I'm not sure, but probably it's like that. But, um, how do we know that a person has the fear of God? How do we know that? How, how, do, how do we recognize a person who has the fear of God? I will say this to you. The church offers a command. Each and every time we are called to the chalice with fear of God, with faith and love, draw near. If you draw near, then I will say that you truly have fear of God. Whether or not you understand it or you don't. Sometimes a person who approaches a chalice without understanding what he's doing, the church speaks of this as being unto condemnation. However, Elder Mielos would say this. Just as he spoke about the individual that would sin at a vigil, and the saint would still say thank you. Whether we approach worthily or unworthily, the concept is this, I am still approaching. I am still revealing that I am a member of the body of Christ, and I desire in eating his flesh and drinking his blood that he is in me and I am in, 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 in him. So in reality, I fear and out of that fear, I love and I desire. One father at the monastery would say this to me, a very beautiful prayer which we must always keep alive within our hearts and our minds is this. My Lord, even if I desire it, or even if I don't desire it, just save me. Because in desiring it, I will do the things which I need to do. But in showing that I don't desire it, I am actually sinning and revealing that I don't want salvation. But I say to him, whether I do either the one or the other, just save me. So this is a combination of fear and love together. Approach the chalice. And when you see someone approach a chalice, understand that this is a man who fears God. So, last question. Uh, what would you uh, say to or about people that sin in order to protect loved ones? So, uh, a very heavy uh, topic came up, uh, suicide, and I have to think, for example, Uh, a 
Okay, I'd like a clarification though. What does that mean? Committing suicide to protect? Uh, I, for example, you had uh, some uh, of the uh, generals that got in, uh, they did something wrong. They know if they didn't commit suicide, their whole family would be persecuted. But if they committed suicide, only they would die. But would you doubt uh, it was? Uh, it's a very specific example. I'm going to uh, specific so. In general, just doing violence, doing even yes. this sounds things to protect someone else who would be down about such. Okay, this, 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 uh, this, this sounds like it, in fact, is, is like a martyrdom and not so much a suicide. Uh, uh, however, however, uh, we, because you call it suicide, we all know that suicide is not something which is pleasing to the Lord because you are taking your, your life into your own hands, okay? And, and this is wrong. This is not a good example to give. Uh, however, being a martyr is something different. You, you, you are placing your, your own life into the hands of someone else because of the fact that you wish to witness to your love for God, your love for your family, which is also another sign of your love for God, okay? And you don't consider your life to be uh, uh, of, of importance in this case, where you give it up to reveal the greater witness of, 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 of preaching about your love for God. However, uh, I believe that, that, that we should be able to not generalize something like that because it becomes a very important thing uh, and dangerous for us to, 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 to enter into the mind of God and to know how he's going to discern this. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it, each, each case is different. So therefore, it, it, that becomes a little bit dangerous to say what is what. Okay, that's something which we need more clarification on. Michael? Michael? Yes, Michael. Even there, we need to be careful. It's it's far better to become a martyr than it is to turn around and kill someone. The last question for Michael. Yes, yes. Uh, yes thank you for your talk. Uh, you mentioned the powerful image of a man dying in the water, uh, in the water, and submitting to the will of God to guide him through the currents. And I wanted to ask, um, how do you achieve the balance between inaction, because you believe that God will, let, will do everything for you, and blindly carving your own path because you believe pridefully that you know best? A good question. Excellent. Uh, the priests who are present and the deacons know very well that at the very beginning of the divine liturgy when they are serving with the deacon the deacon will say it is time for the Lord to act the divine liturgy is in fact an action of the Lord we are offering our own hands our whole, our, our, our whole body into his submission this might be something which is very important for us to understand that I am going to be doing the actions which the Lord has taught me to do in giving myself up to him means that I am offering myself fully and that's the concept of being in the water and, and, and as we lay as a dead man in the sign of the cross we are remaining afloat okay? it's the giving ourselves over into the hands of the Lord so that he can do with me as he sees is fit for my salvation and for the salvation of the world. I need to trust him in that. So I am going to be doing the actions which he inspires me to do. Okay? I remain as a dead man in the, in the sense of what? Not being inactive, but acting according to his will.
Thank you once again, Father Yakovos, for this wonderful, inspiring evening. And uh, as we know that uh, tomorrow you return to your monastery, we wish you a very safe trip back home and uh, please address our respects to the abbot and to all the monks of your monastery. We love them all. From time to time we have the opportunity to go and visit it and to stay with joy there in the monastery to do serve a liturgy and to fill up our batteries. And for the women I can recommend not only the monastery in Ormilia, but also the monasteries in France that belong to the monastery of Simonos Petras, as it is the women's monastery of Solan and the other ones. Thank you, and uh, let me thank also once again His Eminence Metropolitan Anthony, Bishop Docite, Bishop Joachim for their presence, also our distinguished guests, the, their excellencies the ambassadors of Romania, of Bulgaria, of Greece, and also the archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and all of you. It's uh, just a beginning, a new start, I would say, here in this center. And I can announce you already two lectures for the near future. The one will be on the 25th of April, since we will have the visit of an abbot of a monastery of Mount Athos. It will be Archimandrite Bartholomew from Esfigmenu, who is going to speak here on the joy of the resurrection. Today we had a call to repentance, and as I told you, without repentance we cannot celebrate the resurrection. The next lecture will be a joy of resurrection. This abbot, not of the monastery with the black flag, we speak about the canonical monastery of Esfermenu under the Ecumenical Patriarchate. And uh, the abbot is quite young, he's 50 years old. He has a little young brotherhood of monks and he is invited by a Romanian Orthodox parish here in Belgium, in Turnhout, where he will spend three days in the week after Easter. He will celebrate the liturgy on the Sunday after Easter and from that Sunday he will spend some days with us and on the 25th of April that he will speak in Greek he will give a lecture on the joy of resurrection and the 25th of May I have the honor to announce you already a lecture given by a Serbian Orthodox Bishop who resides in Los Angeles Bishop Maxim who already came once and spoke on iconography. This time he will speak on a theological theme. We have not decided yet which this subject will be, but I can already confirm that the 25th of May he will give a lecture here in the Orthodox Center Ambiorics, and he will speak in English. And so we will go on and we hope to be able to inform you from time to time about uh, the people who accept to take the floor here and we to be very happy to have them and to be able to listen to them. I apologize for those who have been standing there for a long time and I promise from now on that uh, we will buy some more chairs and we will bring all people a bit closer so that all of you will be in a comfortable way 
listening to the future lectures here in um, the center. Thank you. I wish you all um, very nice Holy Week, blessed one. There are a lot of Orthodox churches in the city. There are Orthodox churches outside the city. If you look on our website, orthodoxia.be, you can find all the Orthodox churches from the different patriarchates here. You can find them and you can find your way. Please go and attend the services. This is very important for yourself and also for your family while you will uh, bring them together with you to the church. Thank you once again and uh, hope to see you very soon. Tali Anastasia.